In this video, we'll look at tools for understanding the accuracy of classification models. Recall the model that we used to predict whether or not someone would default on a loan. We use logistic regression to predict this outcome based on a person's credit card balance and whether or not they were a student. The box plots below show the predicted probabilities of defaulting for individuals in the training set. The left box plot for those who actually did not default and the right box plot for those who actually did. Because the probabilities in the two groups are never perfectly separated by any probability threshold, the model's predictions on the training data, and thus almost certainly on any external test data, will be subject to error. And it's our job as analysts to explore and characterize this error. Note that in general, it's useful to plot the distribution of predicted probabilities from a classification model across classes because it allows us to see how distinct the predicted probabilities are across classes. These plots can be box plots like we have here or density plots, which can show useful shape information. In classification settings, a tabular display called a confusion matrix is a useful way to organize information on predicted and actual outcomes to see the accuracies and inaccuracies of our model's predictions. In the example here, we used a probability threshold of 0.5 for the previous logistic regression model to make hard predictions for all cases in the training set. A threshold of 0.5 is likely not ideal, but we'll explore that idea a little later in this video. The confusion matrix organizes this information to show model predictions along the rows and actual outcomes along the columns. In a two class binary, setting like this, yes, no outcomes, there are special names given to the cells of this table. The errors in this table are the counts of 39 and 228. The 39 are called false positives because we falsely made a positive prediction. We falsely made a prediction of yes for defaulting on a loan, although the actual outcome was no. The 228 are called false negatives because we falsely made a negative prediction. We falsely predicted that the individual would not default even though they truly did. The other two counts are cases of correct predictions and are called true positives and true negatives. Before we discuss common accuracy metrics, it's important to pause and consider the context in which prediction errors occur. As machine learning practitioners, it's our duty to seriously consider the impact of all of the different types of errors for all people and stakeholders involved in the situation. What does a false positive or negative mean for a loan applicant, the lending or organization, the businesses and neighborhoods impacted by, by loans by the city? If we seriously care about bringing as much benefit and preventing as much harm as possible, it's absolutely crucial to take a holistic systems view of the situation. Further, much like our inspection of residuals as a function of predictors in regression settings, it's important to look at confusion matrices and related metrics that can be computed from them as a function of predictors. This type of error analysis is vital for understanding any systematic biases in our model predictions. Let's take a look at accuracy metrics that can be computed from a confusion matrix. Overall accuracy is the fraction of predictions that are correct, true positives and true negatives over the total number of cases. Our logistic regression model for loan defaults has a high accuracy of 97.33%, but note that this overall accuracy has been computed on the training data. Just as in regression tasks, we might be prone to overfitting and overestimating the quality of the model if we just look at training set performance. We'll return to cross-validation for estimating the true accuracy once we cover the rest of the accuracy measures. Another common metric is sensitivity. Sensitivity is a class-specific accuracy measure that gives the percentage of true yeses that are predicted to be yes. In this case, it's the percentage of actual defaulters whom we predict to default. So there are 333 people who defaulted, but we only detected 105 of them, or 31.53%.
Sensitivity can also be expressed in conditional probability notation as the probability of predicting positive given that the case was actually positive. In other words, the probability of predicting a positive among those who are actually positive. Finally, we have specificity. Specificity is another class-specific accuracy measure that gives the percentage of true no's that are predicted to be no. Here, it's the percentage of actual non-defaulters who we predict to not default. There are 9,667 people who did not default, and we detected 9,628 of them, or 99.6%. Specificity can also be written in conditional probability notation. The probability of predicting a negative among those who are actually negative. Let's take a look at the cross-validation procedure for estimating test out of sample accuracy metrics. Tenfold cross-validation would look as follows for the classification situation and is completely analogous to the regression setting. We first split the training data randomly into 10 folds or subsets. In each iteration, we use the data in nine of the folds as training data to fit the classification model. We test the model on the one remaining fold, the validation fold, to obtain an overall accuracy estimate. Overall, there are 10 iterations, one for each possible validation fold and we get 10 estimated accuracies. We average these to get an estimate of the true accuracy on new data, the test accuracy. Note that we could have used cross-validation to estimate any evaluation metric, not just overall accuracy. We could estimate test sensitivity, specificity, or other metrics. Let's take a look at one more tool for evaluating models in two class, binary, classification settings, and then briefly discuss generalizations to classification settings with three or more classes. So we previously looked at accuracy metrics resulting from a probability threshold of 0.5 for making hard predictions. However, looking at these predicted probability box plots, it seems that 0.5 is likely not the best threshold for making hard predictions. A lower threshold closer to about 0.1 seems more appropriate because it better separates the predicted probability seen in the two classes. Remember that this is a box plot of predictions from the training data, so it may be a little misleading if we're trying to use it to find a single optimal probability threshold for making out of sample predictions. However, it does help us see that a lower probability threshold will likely be better and importantly, it motivates the important idea that we might want to inspect accuracy metrics for a variety of probability thresholds. Computing sensitivity and specificity at a variety of probability thresholds and plotting the results creates what is known as a receiver operating characteristic, or ROC, curve. An example is shown here. Based on one of 10 iterations of tenfold cross-validation, Many different probability thresholds were used and the resulting sensitivities and one minus specificities are plotted here. So why one minus specificity and not just specificity? There really isn't a great reason. It's a matter of tradition. ROC curves have been around for decades. One minus specificity is actually interpretable as the false positive rate. So both axes are still meaningful. So to clarify how the ROC curve arises, each point on the curve comes from one probability threshold. For example, for a probability threshold of 0.16, the test specificity is estimated to be 0.953 and sensitivity is 0.74. For a threshold of 0.0145, test specificity is estimated to be 0.76 and sensitivity is 0.963. We can look at the ROC curves resulting from the 10 different cross-validation iterations together to get a sense of the variability and uncertainty in the estimation of these curves. Each colored line corresponds to one of the 10 cross-validation iterations. 
If we're using these curves to guide our choice of probability threshold, we can consider for each CV iteration a couple of questions. What sensitivity and specificity ranges are acceptable for my data context? What threshold results in the highest sum of sensitivity and specificity? Viewing these results across cross-validation iterations can guide our thinking on this. Another way to use ROC curves across the cross-validation iterations is to compute a metric called the AUC, or the area under the ROC curve. It's worth pausing here to think about why this can capture the quality of a classification model and why higher AUC values indicate higher quality models. As you do think over this, also consider why the optimal AUC value is one. As with any quantitative metric that, be, that can be computed from an iteration of cross-validation, we can average the AUCs across CV iterations to get an estimate of test or out of sample AUC. So the metrics we've discussed so far have been in the context of classification problems with two classes. Often classification will involve three or more classes. Overall accuracy extends directly to the setting. It's still the fraction of all predictions that are correct. Sensitivity and specificity are used for two class settings when there's a positive and a negative class, but the idea of class specific accuracy metrics still applies. For example, in this three class setting where the classes are A, B, and C, we can still examine the fraction of actual A's that are predicted to be A's, and similarly for the B and C classes. They won't have the names sensitivity or specificity, but they can be described in the data context. One last note is about how we can calibrate our interpretation of high versus low values of these evaluation metrics. To motivate this, we might see an estimated overall test accuracy of 90% and be impressed that it seems pretty high. However, we need to calibrate that perception by looking at the class distribution in our training data. Let's say that our data was made up of 88% class A, 7% class B, and 5% class C. This class composition is very useful for calibrating our view of the 90% estimated test accuracy because we see that one class, class A, generally seems to be very prevalent. In particular, if we made a silly classifier that just predicted the majority class in the training data, so a classifier that always just predicts class A, we'd likely just do well in general because A seems to be so common. In particular, on the training data, our silly classifier would have an 88% overall accuracy. In particular, the overall accuracy on the training data resulting from a classifier that just uses the training set's majority class is often called the no information rate. This metric can also be calculated in the test set as well, but the no information rate is useful for calibrating our perception of method performance. In summary, we've looked at various tools and metrics for evaluating classification models. To get a fair view of test, out of sample predictive performance on new data, we can use cross validation as we had before in the regression setting. Finally, we should try to calibrate our perception of these estimated quality metrics by taking into account the prevalence of different classes. A useful metric for this is the no information rate.